Okay, so um, as Sam already said, I'm going to be talking about the British television Gothic. I'm going to be splitting it into three kind of key sections, and then there's going to be a bit of discussion time at the end, kind of more general discussion time. So I'm going to start by looking at what I actually mean by the television Gothic. Um, for anyone who's kind of unfamiliar with that area, then we'll pause and have um, some kind of question or discussion time if anyone's got any questions about that or there's anything that needs to be clarified. So I'll be summarizing it quite kind of concisely. So if there's anything that you, you're confused then I can go back into that in a bit more detail. Then I'm gonna be looking at um, kind of six uh, key texts. And so I'm gonna group them into to bunches of, of three. That's gonna be slightly weird in terms of the timeline because it spans like 35 years in the first block and then like 10 in the second block. So uh, that, that's gonna make it slightly interesting. Um, but otherwise the, the chunks would be weirdly timed. So we'll see how that works. Um, so these are the texts that I'm gonna be discussing today um, as kind of the canon of the British television Gothic. Uh, so we have Nigel Neal's The Stone Tape from 1972. Uh, Stephen Vogt's Ghost Watch from 1992. I'm, I'm wrapping the t-shirt here. Um, then two episodes of Doctor Who. So we've got The Idiot's Lantern by Mark Gatiss uh, from 2006 and Blink by Stephen Moffat from 2007. Uh, series two and three of Toby Whithouse's Being Human um, from the kind of turn of the 2010s. Um, two episodes of uh, Inter Number no. Nine by Rishi Smith and Steve Pemberton who Slightly out of the League of Gentlemen, if you've seen that and haven't seen Inside Number Nine. Uh, so, Seance Time from 2015 and Deadline uh, from 2018. And then Mark Gatiss's The Dead Room from 2018. The Dead Room is a slightly contentious choice um, because all of these are about television, except The Dead Room, which is about radio. But I'm going to try and justify why I'm including that. And you may or may not agree. And you can tell me whether you think that my justification uh, is reasonable or not. Um, you could also include um, Dead Set by Charlie Brooker here. Um, I'm not going to purely because it's about zombies and all the rest are about ghosts, so it kind of diverges from that tradition, but I will address it at the end. Um, and if anyone's seen that and is interested in it, we can talk about how that, that works. So here's some images um, from the text. So you can see here that um, they all use this kind of screen imagery. So, from, from top to bottom, left to right. So we have uh, the stone tape, ghost watch, the idiot's lantern, being human, seance time, and the dead room. So I like this image of the dead room here because even though it's not about kind of television broadcasting, this is just the window that you see him friend in here. It still has that kind of screen imagery, which I think is really interesting, but we'll, we'll come back to that when we look at the text in a bit more depth. So I thought it would make sense to start by establishing what the television Gothic actually is. Um, so you might have heard the term televisuality used before. Um, it's normally associated with um, a man called John Thornton Caldwell. And he used it to describe this kind of strain of American broadcasting, commercial broadcasting in the 70s and 80s, when there are lots of different commercial channels kind of popping up in America that had to compete with each other for viewership. And so, they would broadcast what's known as event television, which is kind of what we'd now call a water cooler moment, television that people are compelled to tune into. Um, and so that's very different from, from the kind of text I'm discussing here. I'm not sure how familiar people are with the structure of the BBC. All of these texts are broadcast on the BBC. And for anyone who doesn't know, it's Britain's oldest um, broadcasting uh, corporation, Sons of the British Broadcasting Corporation. And it's a terrestrial public service broadcaster. And it's funded by, Everyone who watches television, so either on an actual television set or if you just watch um, on catch up services online, you have to pay a, an annual license fee, which is about £150, slightly less. Um, and that funds uh, the BBC, so there's no adverts on the BBC. Um, so it's quite a unique kind of structure. So it's very different from, from what Caldwell was, was talking about with, with the television. Um, but some of what he talks about does kind of feed into the idea I'm working with. So he talks about this structural inversion. So the style isn't just kind of a separate element to the narrative, but it's actually kind of a core component. So that's what I'm, I'm looking at here. So in all of the texts I'm looking at, they're about broadcasting as well as being a television broadcast in themselves. So lots of it has been written about 
the Gothic and television. The most famous example is Helen Wheatley's monograph, Gothic Television. And she talks about it in terms of the domesticity of both the form of the television and the Gothic um, as kind of a, a domestic mode that's interested in kind of family traumas. And she talks about how those um, work well together. A lot's also been said about kind of the, the relationship between spectrality and technology. So there's a fantastic book that I really recommend by Jeffrey Skunts called Haunted Media. And if you buy one book off the back of this, that's the book I recommend. It's fantastic. And he looks at how technology from the telegraph through to the television has influenced um, kind of the way that we perceive ghosts and hauntings. It's a fantastic book. And so he talks about these kind of self-reflexive meditations that look at our, our relationship um, with technology and um, how that's kind of used in haunting narratives. Um, Lenora Ledwins also talks about this. Um, she, she says that television would seem to be the ideal medium for Gothic inquiry um, because it's this box in our homes that shows us these kind of insubstantial images. And Skunt is a really similar thing. So it's this kind of insubstantial image that kind of travels through the ether. So he describes the TV um, as a haunted apparatus. Um, so that's kind of a key component of the televisual Gothic is that the television itself kind of takes on this um, kind of sense of, of spectrality. And so we can actually see this um, going much further back, way back to the 17th century. So another book that I really recommend um, is Susan Owen's The Ghost of Cultural History. And she goes way back to the 11th century, right through to kind of the contemporary moment. And she looks at how British kind of ghost stories um, have developed over time. And it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and she looks at you know in the same way that Sconce was saying the way that they've been influenced by new developments in technology so she includes this dictionary definition of of the magic lantern which you may have heard of it's kind of a very early version of kind of a, a, a cinematic projector so an image would be projected onto a screen or into a white wall and there's this, this dictionary definition she gives from 1696. And here you can see that it's being associated with spectrality um, and with horror. So going right back to kind of the very genesis um, of television and of broadcasting media, we already have this association with the Gothic, which is really interesting. Um, this image in the background of the slide is something called an Edifusicum. And it's basically, uh, it's kind of like a, a box with, with multiple layers and the um, different components could be pulled with pulleys and strings and people would also use things like um, foils or stones in a jar for sound effects and they do things like kind of ocean scenes um, and some people who are very wealthy uh, could have these set up in their homes and kind of entertain their friends so it's basically the first kind of television set um, and it was, was this invention um, that inspired Vathek, which, which is quite a famous uh, Gothic text. So you can see here this relationship between kind of early kind of televisual ancestors and the Gothic kind of intertwined in that way. Um, so Owens also talks about how until the 18th century, ghosts weren't kind of perceived as being translucent in the way that we think of ghosts now. That actually was influenced um, by kind of technology like the Magic Lantern or the Phantasmagoria, which some of you might know a bit about. Um, so because those kind of technologies projected these ghostly images in a way that made them seem translucent because they were light projections, that was actually what prompted this idea of the ghost as a kind of translucent entity. So we can see this really close relationship between the technology uh, and, and the way that we perceive the ghost, kind of ontology of, of the ghost. And so, so here's another quote from Linny Blake and Xavier Aldonares from MMU, two of my uh, tutors who, who talk about how ghosts uh, molded their appearance and their hauntings and the media that transmits them. So in that sense, we can't really separate the way that we perceive ghosts from the medium in which um, they're kind of conveyed. So this is really central to, to what I'm looking at here. Um, and this is kind of a, a symbiotic relationship because when a uh, colour vision was, was invented, the first program that the BBC commissioned was something called Late Night Horror. And so they wanted to use um, kind of horror to show off their, their new technology um, and to get the most out of, of this new, uh, new imagery. Actually, it wasn't a very successful production because most people still had black and white televisions. And they kind of the only <laughs> particularly um, impressive thing about it was the visuals. So people watching it on, on black and white television uh, weren't that impressed. 
and some people had kind of a real moral outrage about it um, because of kind of they thought it was too graphic seeing actual red blood, which, which is interesting. The late night horror wasn't very successful, but it shows this kind of concurrent relationship between um, kind of broadcasting technologies um, and the supernatural. So uh, the last kind of concept that I want to look at before we have our, our first break, um, just to make sure that everyone's clear on these things, uh, is this concept of network spectrality. And if anyone's not familiar with that, there's a really good summary here from Neil Kirk, who's one of the people who's done some really good work on it. So he describes it as representations of ghosts that are transitioning from the singular, linear, personal and analog to ghosts that are digital, multiple, nodular and distributive. So what he's talking about there is kind of the transition from the traditional haunted house story or the Indian burial ground story or those kind of much more traditional narratives where the ghost is rooted in a particular place, people are haunted within a particular house. And he's talking about instead this idea of the ghost as kind of a contagion and we'll talk a bit more about that going on. It's obviously quite timely at the moment. Um, he talks about the way that that was really influenced by technology from the telegraph uh, onwards because suddenly people could transmit information simultaneously all the way across the world and it could be kind of experienced by multiple people simultaneously especially with the advent of radio and the television uh, obviously when something's on tv we don't have to take it in turns to watch it we can all watch it at the same time and so there was this new idea of a ghost or something that could kind of haunt multiple places and people simultaneously so that's something that really comes into to a lot of these texts, some in particular. Um, but before we go into the text, I just wanted to pause there. I know we're only a few minutes in, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone is clear on all of that. Or if anyone has any questions or wants anything elaborated anyway, then you can ask me now. We'll make sure that that's all cleared up before we go on to um, the kind of body of the, the textual exploration. So I'll just, I'll pause my video. So the stone tape, um, the stone tape is the earliest example of the British television Gothic. So like I mentioned, it was broadcast in 1972. It's about a company called Ryan Electric and they're led by a man called Peter Brock. And they take up residence in this Victorian mansion called Caskerland, um, where they've been tasked to develop a, a completely new recording medium. So they're trying to kind of revolutionise uh, broadcasting technology. Uh, but one of the rooms in the house, even though the house is Victorian, there's one room that's about a thousand years old, um, but the rest of the house has been built around. Um, and uh, there's a character called Jill. She's the, the team's computer programmer. She's the only woman on the team. Um, she's, she's their computer programmer and she's also Peter's lover. He's having an affair with her. She goes into this room by herself and she sees this apparition that you, you can just about see here on the screen. Uh, and they identify her as being a, a woman called Louisa, who was a maid in the house in the 19th century. And, and she's um, quite traumatized by this because Louisa kind of screams and falls to her death. And it really um, upsets Jill because she doesn't like to think of this kind of eternal loop of suffering. But they realize that actually she, she's not conscious. Um, there's no kind of remnant of her, her psychology or her emotions uh, in the room. But actually, the, the stone has acted as kind of a recording medium. Uh, so she's actually just really being broadcast into the room by uh, the stone uh, that it's built with. And Peter is very excited by this because he's been sent there to develop a new recording medium and he's just conveniently just found one. Uh, so he kind of in, he talks about the ghost as being a massive data. And so instead of kind of developing a new technology, they decide that they're just going to try and analyze the stone and work out how they can reproduce it and patent it. They can make lots of money out of this thing that they just happen to discover. But what happens at the end is that it's kind of like, um, I don't know if, if any of you used to kind of record television before we had catch up services. I remember recording television onto VHS tapes and then onto DVDs. And if you wanted to use the video again, if you were done with it, you could record over it. And so, the stone of the room is kind of like that, so it, it records over itself. And Peter manages to kind of accidentally delete the recording um, of Louisa. But underneath there are all these other layers, all these other recordings dating back centuries. And Jill goes into the room again, and she's kind of overwhelmed by all of these images. And she goes up these stairs that you can see here that Louisa's at the top of, um, and she ends up falling to her death screaming for Peter and so that becomes the latest recording on the stone. Um, 
Peter isn't very upset by this, <laughs> which we'll we'll go into in a bit more detail later. But he's not he's not a very uh, he's not a very emotional man, and the death of his lover doesn't particularly affect him. Um, so it's this very kind of cold ending. Um, so we get this kind of relationship um, between the technology uh, and the hauntings that's explored um, on on the level of narrative. So we've got this quote here from Dart and Abbott who um, talk about um, the way um, that Louise is depicted. So we we see, you know, it's not just that, you know, she is a recording, but she also looks like a recording. Um, so she appears as kind of slightly degraded, um, flickering, fading video footage, kind of like a weak TV signal. And she's also in black and white, um, as kind of recordings would have been in the 19th century. So we have this relationship there on a kind of ontological level between the ghost and, and um, recording technologies, which is really interesting. And Jill um, talks about this as well. So um, she's kind of the most perceptive member of the team. And she says, there must be a decay, whatever's stored in the stone, the recording. Otherwise, it would be like perpetual motion, an impossibility. It would have to corrode and lose definition. So she understands the kind of nature the relationship between the ghost and, and, and the technology that it's kind of replicating. Um, so what we get here is this kind of scientific um, justification um, of the existence of ghosts. Um, so there's a quote here from, from Chris Baldick about how um, Gothic fiction often kind of explores this kind of archaic past. But in doing so, it kind of relegates it to this kind of regressive past age and says, oh, we're, we're so much better than this now. Um, but we don't really get that um, in Ghostwatch. Uh, sorry, in, in the stone tape. Um, so instead we have this kind of um, horror where at, we have to, you know, the, the team have to confront these ghosts as kind of a reality of this rational modern age, even though they're not ghosts in the traditional sense. And in the end, they kind of triumph. So they aren't able to replicate the technology. Jill dies and their careers kind of fall apart. So we actually have kind of this failure of the modern age because, you know, it's this kind of very kind of capitalist uh, narrative of, you know, Peter doesn't care about his lover. He just wants the money that comes from kind of patenting this technology that he hasn't even invented. He's just found it. Um, so we get this very kind of critical um, narrative and there's also kind of this, um, it explores kind of British nationalism in two ways. Um, so first of all, um, we have a look at the um, kind of rivalry between Britain and Japan in terms of um, technological advancement. Um, so at the beginning, uh, Peter asks his team if they want a pep talk and, and Cliff says about the Japs, there's some unfortunate <laughs> language in this in this program, um, but it is the sort of language that these people would have used. They're, they're very callous and, and very kind of very British. Um, and uh, Peter says, Cliff it is always about the Japs. In 10 years, they're going to have us by whatever part of their, our anatomy they pick. There'll be no electrics industry anywhere in the world but theirs. So, which, which is interesting because obviously now Japan really is at kind of the forefront of, of, of technology. And in 1972, um, Nigel Neal kind of explores this anxiety. Um, and so uh, Bruin's written about the Japanese Gothic and um, he talks about um, in the 1980s in America in particular, but, but this also applies to Britain to some extent, this idea of the Japan problem, which was um, the idea that kind of the, the West might be overtaken uh, by Japan's advancements, uh, which obviously horrified these white Westerners. And so a response to this was um, uh, kind of gothic um, text that kind of articulated this anxiety using kind of supernatural imagery. So he talks about Japan Incorporated, which is this idea of Japan itself as a kind of, of corporate a corporation. Um, and he talks about this as um, following two modes. So the feared other and the feared same. And there, there's also a, a quote from, um, Bainstock Analytics, The Gothic Other, where she talks about the fear being that actually there's, there's no categories of otherness. Actually, there's nothing that divides us from the people that we have these anxieties about. We're actually all the same species and we're very similar in the most kind of essential ways. And that in itself is a fear. So, you know, Peter isn't afraid of 
Japan because they're kind of this kind of othered um, entity in the way that you might see kind of foreign nations explored in older texts like Dracula. What he's scared of is that that they're kind of the same as, as Britain, but actually better, which is horrifying to him. Um, he's, he's got this real patriotism. Um, and so another kind of strain uh, of this patriotism is this idea of kind of, of um, British nostalgia and, and British superiority. Um, there's a, a reference Peter Ackroyd makes to this poem, The Ruin, uh, which opens uh, with a line that translates to race like is this native stone. So there's this idea of the actual material of England being kind of in, uh, inherently kind of spectral. Um, and Susan Owens also talks about this book, Haunted England, um, which was brought out by a publisher who also brought out books on um, British architecture and, and British rural heritage. So there's this idea of ghosts as being part of the kind of national character. And we also have this in the stone type. Um, so they, they, they realise that, um, that the, the stone that the room's made of is something called Kentish rag. And Peter asks Collinson, who's a member of his team, if it's rare. And Collins says, good grief, no, it's been quarried ever since Roman times, used all over the south of England. Most of medieval London is built on this stuff. So Peter's really pleased about this. Um, because in that sense, kind of the entirety of England becomes this quarry that he can use. And in that sense, there's this sense of British superiority over kind of more, more recent uh, Western nations, um, like kind of westernized America, that doesn't have this kind of ancient connection between the civilization and, and the actual material um, of the country. So even though they don't really acknowledge competition with America, it's kind of implied um, in these insinuations. But this also kind of sparks some anxiety. Um, so um, Peter says to his team, uh, you know what this means, don't you? If you're right, they'll be in here, the environment boys, the conservationists, nailing their little notices on the door. They could stop everything if they got into this. So he's obsessed with kind of this idea of a glorious British future. So there's a, a part where they kind of have this breakthrough where he says the Japs are forced into a blind alley. They've got nowhere. It's going to be ours, all ours. So he uses this kind of, warlike imagery kind of harking back to this kind of British like warlike nostalgia um, and kind of this colonial nostalgia. Um, so he's very, even though he kind of looks back in that sense, he's really interested in progress and in Britain's future. And so he's really afraid um, that kind of people interested in Britain's past are going to ruin his life and uh, prevent him from making this progress. Um, so there's this kind of horror there that actually comes true in the end. So at the end, after Jill's dead, um, a sergeant who's kind of guarding the premises for them uh, tells him uh, that the conservation inspectors were there again and they said there'd be a summons. So that's kind of the conclusion to the story that actually um, that this room is going to be reclaimed, taken back to the past. Um, so they describe the ghost as a dead mechanism. So there's nothing living about it. It's kind of a neutral entity. And history is kind of trade is the same way here. So it's something that might be of interest to conservationists, but it's not something to be kind of um, revitalized in the present. Um, and so there's this kind of idea that a kind of aggressively active from patriotism is doomed to fail. And what's interesting is that um, it, it was based um, on Kingswood Warren, which was um, also a, a Gothic mansion. And from uh, 1948 uh, until uh, the early 2010s, uh, the BBC did their technical research uh, in Kingswood Warren. Um, so there's this association here between um, this kind of Victorianism um, and kind of technological development. And Derek Johnston, who also has a fantastic book um, about televisual horror called Haunted Seasons, uh, talks about how BBC decision makers believe the national identity should be based heavily on Victorian concepts. So, and we, we see that literally in the use of, um, of Kingswood Warren or, or of Taskerland. So there's this idea that, you know, if we try to embed the past too firmly in the present, we're going to be doomed to fail and maybe someone's going to horrifically die. <laughs> Probably not quite that as dramatic in real life, but we get this real condemnation of this kind of attempt to repeatedly bring um, the past back into the present. So Ghostwatch uh, was broadcast 20 years later. Um, so we had this kind of 
cause uh, in the television gothic for a period of about 20 years. Um, and it kind of returned with a vengeance with Ghostwatch. So um, it was described as a, a unique live investigation of the supernatural. So it was kind of posed as a real kind of investigative outside broadcasting piece um, where um, they go into a home um, of a woman called uh, Pamela, er uh, uh, Pamela Early, who has two daughters called Suzanne Kin, young, youngish daughters. Uh, they live in a house on a, a road called Fox Hill Drive in Northolt, which is an area of London. And it's haunted by a ghost that they call Pipes, because when they first heard the, these noises the ghost made, uh, the children asked Pamela what it was, and she said, oh, it's Pipes, it's in the central heating, so they call it Pipes. Um, and it was presented by Michael Parkinson, who we, we can see the back of his head here, uh, Sarah Green, Mike Smith and Craig Charles. So people here might not be familiar with them, but they were very familiar British figures, uh, particularly associated with the BBC at this time and very trusted figures. Um, and Sarah Green presented children's television. Um, Michael Parkinson was a talk show host and they were very kind of trusted. So this was kind of a key component of the text. And it's very clever. It was presented as a drama in that it was in the Radio Times before and there's, you know, writer's credit to the beginning, but it, it started airing at 9.25 uh, in the evening on Halloween night. But another programme on another channel that was also a programme lots of people were interested in was finishing at 9.30. So a lot of people tuned in five minutes in and they missed the opening credits. Um, so they, a lot of people thought that it was real. Um, and so they're kind of exploring this haunting and for a long time you think you know it's all it's not real um but but then uh things start to go very wrong and at the end a crew member gets injured Sarah Green probably dies she gets trapped in this cupboard under the stairs with the ghost um Parkinson gets possessed by the ghost the BBC studio gets completely destroyed and they broadcast what they call a massive chaos to the entire nation and um what Stephen Volk, the writer, and his team wanted to do um, was at the very end when we, our televisions are infected by pipes, he wanted to broadcast a really high pitched sound that only dogs would hear so that they'd bark at the television because there's a reference earlier on to dogs barking at the television. And the BBC said, no, <laughs> we're not going to do that. So uh, they didn't quite get allowed to go that far. But people really believed that it got so many complaints so it's still a banned program the BBC still won't broadcast it again it's quite hard to get hold of you can get a, a, a DVD produced by the BFI but it's never broadcast by the BBC still to this day uh, even though surely people wouldn't think it was real now because it's so clearly dated but um, yeah it caused such outcry that there's still kind of this fear um, so um, it created this fear because of the um, Kind of appearance of reality and so um there's this quote here from uh, a woman who says that when she watched it she says i felt literally sick with fear standing in the corner of my room peeking out between my fingers was it only me who was seeing this and worse could i see me and i assumed she was a child at the time but she was 25 <laughs> when she saw it so it really really affected people um but what it was that really got to people wasn't kind of this kind of appearance of reality it was actually who they'd chosen to present it and so there's a documentary called Ghostwatch Behind the Curtains um, and in it uh, someone says I saw it and I thought it was real when I saw Michael Parkinson um, and someone else says everyone was just playing their ordinary roles so it didn't seem out of the ordinary and you were just like it must be true because Parky wouldn't lie so they used these kind of BBC figureheads to convince people uh, that what they're seeing is real and so there's this sense um, of the BBC um, kind of this, this familial figure this auntie figure betraying them so the real horror isn't just Pipes' existence it's not just that he's been broadcast into people's homes it's that he's been broadcast by the BBC and that he's possessed Michael Parkinson that really affected people um, and so Jarrett and Abbott talk about how it, it used kind of this aliveness to create its horror but actually you know it, it was the figurehead that really had this uh, particular impact um, and there's also some really interesting um, kind of dialogue on it in this program called Bite Back uh, which um, it was like a complaints program or a response program where after a, a broadcast especially a controversial broadcast 
audience members could go on and they could talk to the writers and the producers and the directors about what they thought of it. And so there's some really interesting quotes from Bite Back. So someone says, it was actually theoretically a brilliant piece of television, but I also think that you betrayed the trust that the audience has within the BBC. And another man says that Michael Parkinson is a well-respected and mature fatherly figure. He's very angry because he, because of Michael Parkinson, he let his child watch it, even though it was on past the watershed, and his child was very distressed by this. And, and the writers and, and the crew quite rightly say, that, that was your fault, really. <laughs> um, but a lot of people did this, and there was absolute outcry in some areas. So um, the only identified cases of PTSD in children being caused by a television broadcast caused by Ghost Watch. And there was a real controversy where someone um, blamed the suicide of her son on, on the fact that he'd seen Ghostwatch, which is quite contentious because her evidence is that he, he left a note in which uh, he says that she doesn't have to worry because he'll be a ghost. So blaming it on Ghostwatch seems somewhat reductive there, but there was this whole narrative uh, around it as this traumatic text. Um, and um, so... You know, they talk about, uh, Stephen Volk, the writer, talks about how, you know, he chose the BBC because it wouldn't work on any other channel. He had to exploit the trust that people have in that broadcaster and in these figureheads. Um, and uh, Murray Leader also talks about how, um, you know, the BBC is all about nation building, creating this positive image of Britain. And actually, Ghostwood completely turns that on its head. And instead, kind of, the BBC becomes the site of horror um, in the nation. So that was, you know, an extraordinary kind of response that it prompted. There's also some really interesting stuff about class, though, in Ghostwatch. Um, so uh, Foxfield Drive is this kind of working class streak um, that's kind of then inhabited by these very middle class uh, presenters. The exception is Craig Charles, uh, which I'll, I'll come back to in a second, who, who's Scouse, um, and is the only kind of uh, working class presenter. Um, and interestingly, he's the one who goes out on the street and engages with the residents. So there, there's some interesting class dynamics going on there. And so, you know, there's always the question with a haunted house narrative is why don't, why don't you just leave? Um, that has to be answered by anyone who's telling a kind of haunted house narrative. And um, Pamela addresses this and she, she lives in a council house. And um, she says, uh, so if, if, I don't know if that's a British term. It, it's a... Kind of like one that's, that's kind of partially funded by the welfare state. Um, so she says, I wrote to the council to try to get us moved, but they wouldn't take it seriously, you know, like I was lying. So she's trapped because of her economic situation. And there's a sense that because she's working class, the council don't really take it seriously. They don't think that she's intelligent and that she, she doesn't know what's going on. And at this point in the broadcast, nothing supernatural has happened yet. So we might be thinking, well, yeah, obviously your house isn't haunted, ghosts aren't real. Um, and she talks about how she then turned to the news media to try to, to kind of help her out. Uh, but they made her look even more like idiots. Um, but then actually, of course, at the end of the text, um, she's kind of vindicated. Uh, so there's this idea that, you know, it criticizes both the trust in the BBC and this idea of kind of classist intellectual superiority. And interestingly, there's, uh, there's this bit where, um, um, Parkinson interviews Sarah Green about this ghostly experience that she had, and this is apparently a real story of something she really experienced in her life, whether you believe that or not is up to you, but she says that she was uh, visiting uh, some friends in a house in the Cotswolds, they live in a 15th or 16th century house that once belonged to the Viceroy of, in uh, of India, um, and she says that she saw this ghost of a, a concubine that lived in the grounds, um, and it was apparently distressed because the ground where, where the concubine had been buried because uh, they couldn't be buried on consecrated ground um, because the ship wouldn't, wouldn't allow it. Uh, they were distressed that it was going to be dug up. Uh, but she says that it wasn't scary at all. So we have this sense here that her kind of freedom to leave is what gives her that protection, whereas the concubines couldn't leave and the early family can't leave uh, because of their position in society. Um, so we also have this idea of the North being this Gothic space, uh, this kind of working class, othered kind of setting. But we also see that in London. So London has some very like condensed working class populations, whereas most of the South East um, is very middle class and London is kind of the exception. 
Uh, and Northall in particular kind of feeds into this. So at the time, uh, it had a Conservative MP, Harry Greenaway. And at the next election, he lost to Labour, Stephen Pound. Um, and Stephen Pound beat him by over 9,000 votes, whereas before, he had a majority of over 6,000. So it's kind of a politically liminal space as well. Um, and with traditionally the Conservatives being more associated with the middle class interests and Labour with the working class interests. So there's some interesting kind of liminality there. Um, and so the entire street is haunted, um, like I mentioned. So Craig Charles, the only working class presenter, goes out and he talks to some of the, the neighbours and they talk about some horrible things that have happened. So a, a young girl went missing, a five-year-old child got knifed, and some children found a, a dead Labrador that had been cut open and it was pregnant. So there were all these puppy fetuses all over the floor. We didn't actually see this. We just told about it. The BBC probably wouldn't have allowed that. Um, so there's this idea of this kind of working class street as being this gothic space, but also kind of at the end, when kind of piped as broadcast to the nation, there's this idea that actually this trauma that they're experiencing could happen to anyone. So again, it breaks down the idea of the gothic other. It breaks down the idea of the working class other because actually it implies this could actually happen to anyone. Um, maybe not this specifically, but kind of, you know, we, we hear a lot now about how uh, most people are only three paychecks away from homelessness. So uh, we kind of see that in the way that the narrative is treated. So um, the last text I'm going to look at before we have a short question break uh, are two texts from Doctor Who. So we have The Idiot's Lantern and Blink. So The Idiot's Lantern is set uh, just before Queen Elizabeth II's coronation. So this is a time of, of what's called post-war consensus. So um, we kind of had socialism had been kind of had influenced uh, the fabric of British society. We had things like the NHS and uh, a, a much more strengthened welfare state, so equality had been uh, reduced. There's also more kind of community spirit, kind of post-war, and um, you can argue that, that was actually facilitated uh, by the BBC uh, in that it broadcast uh, the same things nationwide uh, to everyone in the country who tuned in. So there's this sense of unity in that sense. Um, but at the beginning of this episode, uh, the, the Doctor, who, who for anyone who's not familiar with Doctor Who, so I imagine most people have some level of familiarity. He, he's an alien time traveller, uh, and he has a human companion called Rose in this episode. And um, they, they're walking through the street, and they see all these TV antennae. And Rose says, uh, there's weird, because it looks like everyone's got one, whereas her nan had said that during the coronation, they all had to pile into one person's house because TVs were quite rare. They find out that the reason that some people have them is because they're being sold for five pounds, uh, which is very cheap at the time, uh, by a man called Mr. Magpie, who owns a shop called Magpie Collectibles. And the reason he's doing this is, I don't know if you can see the kind of ghostly image in the middle of the screen, which is this alien entity called Choir. And uh, so that's not actually her. She basically uh, possesses this image of this woman on the television, um, and she can absorb viewers' life, uh, life force through the screen, uh, anyone who's watching. So um, she kind of says to him, oh, uh, I'll let you live if you sell these televisions to people, because what she wants to do is during the coronation, where lots of people tune in, she wants to basically overtake the nation and feed off all of these, these British viewers. Um, at the end, the Doctor, uh, Rose gets kind of absorbed into the screen, so she's not in most of the episodes. So the Doctor works with a teenage boy called Tommy Connolly uh, to kind of vanquish her, and they, they rescue the nation before she manages to, to harvest the souls of the nation. Um, but what's really interesting is the way that this plays into kind of tropes of television uh, made for children. Obviously, Doctor Who is kind of family television, but I'm talking about television for, for young children. Um, so Murray Leader says that children are socialised from a young age to think of television as a porous entity that looks out at the spectator as surely as the spectator looks back. So if anyone has, has ever seen children's television as a child or, or, or as an adult with, with children, you might notice that sometimes they'll say something like, say, did you enjoy the story? And then they pause and they say, oh, glad to hear it. And so they're kind of setting it up as if they can hear the child talking back to him. So obviously some children think that they genuinely can. I remember thinking that the TV could hear me. And actually when the TV was first invented, people really did think that women would do their makeup before they watched the television because they thought that the people could see them. Um, I don't know how they thought logistically that would work. They would see so many people, but that, that's what, what some people thought. Um, so this is kind of used in, in the dialogue. So um, 
the wire addresses Mrs. Magpie at the beginning. She asks if he can hear her, and he says, I, I must be dreaming, I'm going to Lally. And, and she says, not at all. And then she says, now are you sitting comfortably? Then, good, and we'll begin. So we get, she sets it up as if she's about to read uh, a story, but then she kind of absorbs him into the screen with this maniacal laugh. Um, so this kind of education on entertaining uh, children's advice actually becomes a slight horror. Um, and on the kind of cusp of, of domination, she says, good night, children everywhere. And she's framed like this, so the screen is also our screen. Um, which is, you know, again, she, she addresses the shot like the, the young viewers directly as she engages them in the horror, but it also references so there, there was a, a film called BBC Children's Hour that ran between uh, 1939 and 1950. It was presented by someone of lovingly and um, Uncle Matt, and that was his sign off. And it's also the title of a, a Vera Ling song uh, about uh, evacuation. So it kind of transforms these kind of familial comforts and images of national unity into this kind of site of horror. Um, there's also this kind of, it addresses kind of patriotism. So uh, Mr. Magpie says that uh, like providing these televisions is how he justifies it. It's his patriotic duty. Um, so he says, it seems only right that as many folks as possible get to watch the coronation. We may be losing the empire, but we can still be proud. Um, and The Wire also kind of uses this line of reasoning. She says, just think of the audience tomorrow, my dear, all settling down to watch the coronation. 20 million people, things will never be the same again. So that's when 20 million people was a lot of people speaking, but really a lot of people tuned in at one time. Um, so patriotism becomes this kind of site of horror. It's what entraps people. Uh, but at the end of the narrative, the doctor and Rose go to a street party um, to celebrate the coronation. So there's kind of, it's kind of undercut this criticism here. This is by far the most conservative example of the television Gothic. In the, in the end, patriotism doesn't really endanger anyone. Uh, they're all rescued. But we also have this kind of idea of paternalism. Um, so Fred Bottings talks about um, how we kind of have this tyrannical um, or absent father figure, uh, and that kind of sparks the horror in the goth Gothic text. Uh, and um, Tom also talks about that being kind of the cause of acts of domestic violence. And there's a domestic abuse narrative uh, in this episode. So um, Tommy's father, Eddie, uh, is abusive towards him and, and to his mother, Rita. Um, and at the end, he's expelled from the house, kind of concurrently with uh, the the wire being expelled from the sex in this interesting uh, parallel. But what that means for the text is that the doctor kind of stands in as this kind of benevolent father figure, but he also kind of takes on some kind of paternalism. Um, uh, so he, um, we get these shots, so we can, if you can just about see it in the background there, the line, uh, the screen watch the wire appears with, with our screen as the viewer, but we also have it reversed. Uh, so. There are some shots where it's like we're positioned with the wire uh, looking out and while other characters look in, most frequently the doctor. So he's also kind of there looking in on us as this kind of protective, paternalistic figure, um, which kind of brings us on to uh, Blink. So in Blink, uh, it, it's about uh, an alien race called the Weeping Angels. Uh, they look like the, the Weeping Angels statues that you see in cemeteries, the ones with the hands over their faces that people have uh, as kind of elaborate headstones. Um, they can only move while you're not looking at them, but what they do is they, they touch you and they send you back in time. So you live out your life, but you're, you're now dead in the, in the present moment, and they harvest your kind of unlived life. Um, and the Doctor isn't in most of this episode because he's been sent back in time. So he has to communicate with this woman called Sally Sparrow in the present. So he makes these videotapes um, where we have this interesting paradox where he's responding to her because she's written down what he said and what she said. And uh, we get this, this very confusing paradox of how this conversation was actually recorded. But on, on these recordings, uh, he says to her, one of the things he says to her is don't blink, blink and you're dead. Don't turn your back, don't look away, and don't blink. Good luck. And at the very end of the programme, the Weeping Angels have kind of been contained. Um, but we have this montage where we see all of these um, statues, um, all of these stone sculptures, and it's intercut with, with excerpts from, from this address he gave to, to Sally. 
And so this is kind of very timely because we've had all of the discussions around things like the Edward Coulson statue and that kind of colonial uh, symbolism. So this is in, in a way a more transgressive episode in that it explores in that sense the horror of colonialism. These kind of images from the past have, have the power to send us back into the past, to, to destroy us, uh, which is very fitting with the kind of contemporary moment. Um, but uh, that's kind of undercut um, by the fact that um, by tuning into Doctor Who, it kind of implies we're protected. So the Doctor will give us this guidance of how to survive and he'll watch over us through our screens and he'll make sure that we're okay. So it kind of suggests um, that if we tune into the BBC, we'll be protected from the evils of the world, which is very contentious, <laughs> given that the, the BBC has come under fire recently for, for being active. It's, it's supposedly completely unbiased, which is, of course, impossible, and actually it's owned by conservatives uh, and that sometimes makes itself very clear uh, so there's some some interesting uh, suggestions there and uh, it's interesting because when um, when the encounter between uh, the doctor on on the television and Sally is first introduced it's very similar to, to the uh, meeting between Mr Magpie and the wire um, he says something uh, he kind of loses the track of the sentence and she says started well that sentence and he says it got away from me yeah and she says okay that was weird like you can hear me and he says well I can hear you so again this comes from the product where she's transcribed it and he's recorded it um, but he's described as a ghost DVD extra um, so there's this idea here um, actually um, televisual haunting is um, can be like a source of salvation as well as a danger. So there's all of these ideas about kind of the BBC as kind of this, this public service that has this kind of paternalistic responsibility. Um, Robert Aitken, who, who gave the second quote here, hates the BBC. He wrote two books about how much he hates the BBC. But even he says, you know, if it fell silent, think of the gap that would be in our national life. So it's kind of unthinkable to him, but it, it would not exist. Um, and um, this, this man, uh, Nickel, talks about Doctor Who being about Britishness as much as it's about science fiction. So we get this idea of kind of this, this paternalistic identity of the Doctor Who narrative. Um, there's, um, so Helen Wheatley talks about how Doctor Who made you feel unsafe in your own home, but actually here, we do get that to an extent, but we also get the Doctor as this figure looking at us through our screens, providing us with this guidance and protecting us. Um, and so um, there's this, this quote here about the difference between left-wing horror narratives where the threat comes with, from within and right-wing narratives where it comes from without as an alien threat. And in that sense, it's very much a right-wing narrative. You know, even though we have the domestic abuse spotlight, in terms of the, the discourse on nationality in both of these texts, it's literally an alien threat. So it's much more conservative than the other text in that sense. Um, I found this quote very interesting. It, it's talking about um, network horror um, in the 1950s in America. And it talks about how the military acts as setting character, weapons technology, the cause of crisis and the solution to these crises. And we see kind of terrestrial broadcasting and the BBC in particular behaving in the same way here. So we can say that Britain has a sort of kind of broadcast industrial complex in the, in the same vein as the military industry complex of this very complicated relationship with something that we kind of portray as this source of national pride but actually can be quite quite harmful and we've seen this in a metaphorical sense um, in these texts and also the suggestion that you know the danger of, of trusting things implicitly in the next few texts we'll look at is explored much more explicitly what what the danger actually is but I'll pause there um, so if anyone has any questions or is desperate for the toilet or needs a cup of tea then uh, you can, can see to that now. Um, so I will pause there. So, being human then. Um, so, being human is set in a, a house um, that um, was originally inhabited by Annie. We can see her in the background here. She's a ghost. And she was murdered by her abusive fiance, Owen. Uh, and then Owen rents out the house uh, to Mitchell, who's a vampire, and George, who's a werewolf. He doesn't know that. Um, they move into the house and they can see Annie. So normal humans can't see her at this point in the narrative, but they can. Um, they kind of form this very close-knit relationship. This is kind of budding romance between Annie and Mitchell. Um, in the second series, there's this plotline introduced where um, 
Annie it has meant to, to go to the afterlife. She's presented with this door, she meant to walk to, and she doesn't because she wants to stay with George and Mitchell. And she likes her, her life, her undead life. Um, and the kind of bureaucrats uh, from the afterlife are not very happy about that. And so um, what they do is uh, they there's this estate agent called Saul, and Annie, Annie uh, she starts to be seen by normal people, and she gets this job in a pub, and Saul starts uh, frequenting this pub. And they kind of enlist him in kind of entrapping her. So um, they speak to him uh, through through his television, which we'll look at in a second. Um, but he, you know, they have, he and Annie have this kind of budding romance. He turns out to be very abusive as well. He sexually assaults her and then tries to hand her over to the afterlife uh, while she screams for her life. So she has a very traumatic existence, Annie. Uh, nothing ever goes well for her at all. Um, so, um, this is kind of the key, kind of one of the key plots in the second series leading into the first series. Um, so what's interesting is that when Saw is first contacted, he's watching TV and um, he hears someone calling to him and the, the, the image on the TV says, hey, I'm over here. That's right, Saw, it's me, Terry Wogan. And I don't know if if anyone knows who Terry Wogan is, but he was also, he was Irish, but um, was also kind of really associated with the BBC. Um, the point that said, so this is a, a quote from his obituary. Um, so he, he um, is, this woman um, who is Irish herself says, the laconic sign of a limerick grocer has become a quintessential English humorist. With barely a nod over the Irish sea, the knight of the realm is routinely described as a national treasure in his adopted country. And um, at the time that it was broadcast, um, he had just been um, given British citizenship. So, and he'd, he'd been on the BBC for years. So again, he's kind of a similar figure to Parkinson and Co in that sense. So again, um, we get this kind of, obviously he realizes that it's not actually Terry Wogan, that uh, similar to Squire, it's like this, this bureaucrat from the afterlife has invested this image to kind of enlist him. Uh, again, we see this, this kind of, exploitation of the trust that people have in the BBC and in its kind of key figureheads. A really interesting thread of, of being human though is um, that it kind of replicates reality TV. Um, so Annie eventually gets taken into the afterlife and she gets trapped there and in this image we see in the background she's trapped in poetry you can just see this kind of page around her um, and she's communicating with Mitchell and George and uh, George's fiance Nina uh, through their television screen. So TVs and radios and newspapers, but mostly TVs act as this kind of point of communication between the afterlife and, and the kind of world of the living. Um, and so she, she gets sucked in it and Mitchell uh, manages to enter poetry as well to rescue her. So he, he's in love with her at this point. Uh, but what we know, but the other characters don't know, is that uh, he previously, he, he decided he was furious with humanity. So that um, he, he visited this, visits this kind of like vampire den, and he doesn't really like the other vampires. He thinks they're violent and, and um, you know, cruel, but um, it's burnt to the ground and he's really angry because even though he doesn't like them, that's obviously his kind that's been targeted. So he goes onto a, a train and he just massacres the entire carriage. Um, and they call it uh, the Box Tunnel 20 Massacre because they were going through this tunnel called the Box Tunnel and, and he killed 20 people. It's quite a self-explanatory name. Um, so he um, go, goes into the world and he kind of gets this spirit guide uh, called Leah. But what we find out later is that she was one of the victims, but, but neither of us, neither Mitchell nor the viewer know this when he first goes in. Um, and so there's this idea of reality TV as pro providing this kind of therapeutic function. Um, so uh, Williams talks about um, it figuring private pathologies and traumas um, and teaching real people how to live with their very real ghosts. So this is kind of neoliberal model of therapy where, you know, it's not, oh, we'll help you, we'll improve your conditions, but like, we'll teach you how to cope with this horrible life that you lead. Um, but we don't even really get that um, in, in this programme. So, uh, Leah says uh, about uh, Mitchell coming to rescue Annie, that's a big deposit in the good account, which one of us, meaning the victims, does that wipe off the slate? So there's this idea that he's kind of participating in this kind of reality program to work through the, these traumas. 
she she describes it as a quiz show. She says it's like a quiz show, and tonight's star prize, someone's so weird freaking quiz show. But actually, it, it's more like reality television in this working through of traumas. Um, so um, Mitchell says um, that um, killing for him is a compulsion. It was a compulsion. I'm not that man anymore. Um, and so here we have um, what Christian and Tan, they've written on the kind of the morals of reality television about this failure to act on one's norms and justification of poor behavior. Um, and I've just used this reference to Owens here where she talks about um, kind of the, um, the idea of um, the kind of concept of, of purgatory. Um, because it is purgatory that they're in at this point. So there's this idea of um, purgatory being a place from which ghosts um, would kind of return to atone for their sins. So, and that, which kind of fits in with the idea of reality television, of, of people going, if you think of something like Jeremy Carl, which I'll talk about in a moment, people going to work through their problems. So, so we kind of have this, this insinuation. Um, and when um, Mitchell realizes who Leah is, he says, please stop, I don't know what to say. And, and she gets very angry at this point. And she says, don't say anything because every word that comes out of your mouth is a fucking excuse, it's misdirection. And so she, she confronts him with the fact that, you know, he's, he's enacting this behavior that Christian and Tan um, describe him. And so he kind of accepts it. He says, I'll stay. I want you to take me to all my victims. I want to feel it. I want to suffer. I don't want to hide anymore. I just want her back. So he's released. He and Annie start this romantic relationship. There's this sense that kind of a therapeutic function has been performed. But actually, he still doesn't tell anyone about the Box Tunnel 20 massacre. He goes to great lengths to keep it a secret and to avoid being punished for it. So there's this vampire oligarch called Herrick, who's, he was in the, in the fire, but he's returned from the dead. But he's, he's lost his memory. He has no memory of being a vampire. He thinks he's just a normal man. And so Mitchell is trying to, co trying to kind of trigger his memory for two reasons. Partly because he wants to know how to return from the dead, because he's worried that he will die, um, because he's been given this prophecy by Leah that he's going to die. Uh, he doesn't want to die. And he also wants Herrick to murder uh, the detective who's investigating the Box Tunnel 20 massacre. And um, he, he justifies it by saying that they met in war, so they, they, they met during World War I. And that, you know, in wartime, things are different. You can commit normally heinous acts, but they're actually heroic in wartime. And Herrick says, we're not at war. And Mitchell says, we are. And sometimes we ask to do things that seem bad, but they're not. Um, so he's kind of reverted back to the state he was in during the Box on the 20 massacre. He has this disdain for humanity. Um, and he is justifying these kind of heinous, um, heinous acts. And so he manages to evade punishment, but then um, uh, Leah um, kind of, so Herrick attacks Nina, George's uh, fiance, while she's heavily pregnant. And uh, George finds out about this and he thinks that, uh, that, that Nina and, and their baby are dead. And Leah kind of, there's this place called um, the dog fight where vampires bring werewolves into a cage uh, and, and make them fight. And um, this is kind of a class system of, of, of the undead. And um, Leah kind of leads them to this point. Um, and then, because she, want, she wants George to, to, to murder Mitchell, because she knows Mitchell won't kill him. Whereas normally a, a vampire, um, you know, there's, they're, they're equally matched in different ways. But in a cage, uh, a werewolf is gonna rip the vampire to shreds and she knows he won't fight back. Um, and then she brings uh, Annie back into the office. She kind of coaxes her in and says, oh, Mitchell's gonna die, George is gonna kill him and you need to save him. But then when she gets there, um, she says that actually uh, she's kind of orchestrated. There's nothing that she can do to save her. She's just brought her back into the purgatory. He'll stay there with her and to watch. And um, Annie says to her um, that we'll have to watch George, meaning after um, Mitchell's death. I want you to watch, Leah. Watch him turn cold, hard, mean. They're like your comrades, George and Nina. The last time she got to the massacre. So she points out that actually, if you just kind of sit around and observe trauma, all you really do is, is perpetuate it. You're not performing any therapy function. And there's also this imagery of the cage. So we've got the image here of Annie um, trapped in the cage. And that, that's kind of 
the screen uh, uh, Mitchell and George and Nina's screen becomes our screen. So there's this idea that she's also trapped in the television. And then she in in purgatory is watching on a television uh, the um, the scene in which um, Mitchell and Georgia are in this actual physical cage. So there's this idea of reality TV as being a space of kind of entrapment and kind of haunting. Um, and at the very end of the episode, um, Mitchell actually does die, not because George kills him in the cage, um, but he asks George to kill him. He says he doesn't want to hurt his loved ones anymore. He doesn't want to be a danger to them. Um, and so reluctantly, George uh, does kill him. Um, and Nina's really angry with Mitchell about this because she says that he's caused shared trauma for all of them by implicating George in, in, in this kind of ending. So there's this idea of reality TV as being kind of inherently um, restrained and traumatic. Um, so a really good example of this is the Jeremy Carl show. So for anyone who doesn't know, it's a reality TV show where uh, people would go on and they'd talk about their conflict. There would always be something like, oh, my girlfriend slept with my brother or, oh, my mum's stealing my money. And they'd basically have a fight on stage. It was extremely exploitative and it was cancelled in 2019 because uh, a man called Steve Diamond committed suicide after how badly he'd been treated um, by Jeremy Carl uh, on the Jeremy Carl show. And so there's a programme on, on Channel 4, another British terrestrial channel called Dispatches. It's kind of a, an investigative journalism channel. And they did a piece uh, on Jeremy Kyle. And they spoke to lots of other people who had been suicidal, um, uh, but had survived, uh, following their experience with Jeremy Kyle. And one is this uh, man called Dwayne Davison. And he got this image as the most hated man in Britain after his first appearance on Jeremy Kyle. And that was what kind of caused his, his mental health spiral. And afterwards, they reached out and, and they invited him to come back um, to sort out his image and, and become the most liked person. But in the documentary, he says he realised too late once he was on stage, there was no avenue for me to take to become the most liked person or even to redeem myself. They were just after a war on that stage. So there's this idea that, that kind of reality TV is inherently exploitative and actually very dangerous in a very real sense. Um, and so Leah says at one point, I can't control people. You've been watching too much TV, which has this kind of irony to it, because actually it's kind of suggesting that reality TV does have the power to control people and to harm people in a very real sense. So in that sense, kind of producers and consumers, you know, viewers of television have this kind of godlike power, like the kind of purgatory that Annie, Annie entered into. And Annie says, you know, she hadn't done anything, she hadn't done anything wrong. There's this new sense of purgatory, not being as a space of punishment, but just as a space through which everyone has to pass. Uh, so for her, she realizes it's just a holding pen for hell. She's not going to be actually cleansed. It's all just an act for kind of exploitative entertainment. So it really plays into the kind of um, idea of the, the reality TV show there. So then um, we've got two episodes of Inside Number Nine. Um, Seance Time and Deadline. So um, Seance Time is about um, a another kind of reality TV show called Scaredy Cam, uh, where basically they just prank people and they have intense kind of fearful reactions, which is very amusing to people and, and they broadcast that. It's a very kind of lowbrow um, broadcast. And it was canceled previously because a little boy wet himself um, during a live transmission. And the presenter, Terry, doesn't feel bad about this at all. He's just annoyed that it interfered with his career. So kind of uh, earlier um, on in the episode, about midway through the episode, there's a participant called Pete. Um, and there's an actor who plays this demon that during this kind of... So the setting is that it's, it's a seance, um, but actually it's, it's all constructed for, for television. And this demon kind of crawls across the room, but it, it's just an actor. And Pete panics and he punches him in the face and he dies. And... Terry is upset about this, but only because he thinks his program is going to be cancelled again. He doesn't care at all that this actor has just died under his watch. Um, so we have this kind of um, real, again, like capitalist callousness here. But he's confronted by it at the end because we can see the ghost of, um, it turns out that the little boy who wet himself later uh, killed himself uh, because he was so traumatised by his humiliation. And he kind of possesses Pete's body and confronts Terry with, with the, the damage that his actions do. Um, so 
there, in some work by Dale Townsend, he talks about uh, he talks about Gothic Shakespeare, and he talks about how Shakespeare provided uh, two modes of ghost seeing, um, one in Hamlet and one in Macbeth. So in Hamlet, everyone can see the ghost of Hamlet's father, but in Macbeth, uh, only Macbeth can see Banquo's ghost because he's the one who's killed him. So um, in in Macbeth, we get this association between the act of seeing a ghost and personal guilt. So in Seance Time, the only person within the narrative who can see the ghost is Terry, and obviously he's the person most directly responsible for, for these horrors. But we also, as the viewer, see the ghost. And this is the closing shot here, where we previously, this is the monitor in the backstage room, and we've previously seen it glitching. And now we see um, the ghost kind of appear on the screen, looking at us with this kind of enraged expression. So we're implicated uh, in this kind of suggestion of guilt. Um, so, so here, the connection in guilt. So uh, there's a brilliant article um, by Marc Olivier called Glitch Gothic. Um, and he says that the glitch must first register with the human subject as error before it can be called a glitch. In short, horror precedes the glitch. So a glitch isn't a glitch if nobody sees it, opposite to kind of the stone technology guys. Because if nobody sees it, nothing, nothing's malfunctioned, it doesn't matter. So it's not a, a glitch in that sense. So here, you know, when we see the ghost, it kind of disrupts this act of viewership and it kind of forces us to confront the ethics of what we're watching. Um, and so um, we also have th this argument that technology has meant that we can control time itself. So what that means is the fact that we can rewind, fast forward, skip to different parts of the scene, especially if we watch with something like iPlayer, where it's just, you know, a very simple flip. And so, you know, if there's a moment in a horror film that we really like, we might replay it over and over again. And by kind of forcing us to um, confront the ethics of this, so there's a bit where Terry replays the footage uh, of, of the, the actor dying, and he's really upset that, that they can't broadcast this. And he says, what a shame, it was fucking funny. And which is, which is quite a funny line, but then you think of what's actually being discussed here, and it's actually quite horrific. And so this kind of confronts us with Kind of reality of what we consume on television and the ethics of that in the context of reality television and you know there are things there are things like um jeremy carl best fit and there's something so horrific about watching these replays of people going through these really traumatic moments in their lives and this kind of underscores that um so again there's there's what townsend calls a macbethian coupling of ghosts and moral culpability so we're drawn into this this narrative where we are made to feel responsible for what happened to the little boy because of the fact that we're watching. Um, so um, there's this, this part early on where a woman called Tina, a participant in the show, uh, she finds out what's happened, that she's been broadcast on Saturday Cam, and she says, I thought they cancelled it. And Terry says, they did, but it's back now. And Tina says, on ITV. And Terry very kind of stiffly says, no. So um, ITV, again, for people who don't know, is the second oldest terrestrial uh, broadcaster in Britain. It's also a very kind of prominent, uh, kind of had a prominent place in British culture. It's, it's often not seen as, as kind of a, a kind of noble as the BBC, but it is very much a prominent part of, of British like, media culture. Um, and at the time, um, the terrestrial channels, especially the BBC, um, but they still made up um, the kind of the main segment of people's viewing. So even though there are all of these channels now, um, in 2014 to 2015, so, so during the time this was produced, uh, so it said almost a third of people watching TV at any moment in time are watching the BBC, and about half are watching one of the main five channels. So uh, that's ITV, um, Channel 4, and then um, various BBC channels. So um, th there's this kind of prestige attached to it. You know, it, it's it's more impressive, in a sense, to be broadcast on one of these channels than on, on, a, on a commercial channel. Uh, but there's also this kind of economic side to it. So um, Dolby here talks about uh, Dennis Potter, who gave this speech um, that was very anti-Thatcherism uh, uh, and her impact on broadcasting. So she, he talks about um, how she, she kind of um, encouraged the privatisation of television and this cost-driven approach consumer focused approach so instead of producing kind of quality television instead television started being produced just to appeal to what people thought the masses would be interested in so more people would tune in so they could sell more adverts not on the bbc um but they could sell more tv licenses um 
And so it was all based on economics rather than art. Uh, and um, Dennis Potter was, was outraged by this. Um, and so, um, so he also talks about how she was concerned with broadcasting the landscape um, from uh, broadening the landscape from the duopoly of BBC and ITV to, to more, including more private enterprises. So she was really involved in kind of privatizing British television. Um, so we, we get this, this move to consumer-led model, as I mentioned. Um, and so Perry isn't just concerned about the fact that he's no longer on, the, on ITV, he also has these economic concerns. So he, he mentions that on YouTube, uh, he says, three million hits that pissing boy got, and I didn't see a penny of it. So he has this kind of very like satirite neoliberal view of television as kind of something that should go viral to generate as much profit as possible. And so um, when the BBC was founded, uh, Lord Reef um, had this kind of journalistic idea of the BBC should improve its viewers, it should give them quality content. Uh, that was in the same sense as kind of the, the kind of improvement educational novel of the kind of 18th century. Um, and now instead we have this consumer-led model, which, you know, it, it subverts this kind of paternalistic model. So we might think that it has kind of more equality in terms of class, but it does not. Um, so, um, you know, he, he says, uh, Darby says that um, it gives us kind of an image into, you know, images of class in terms of, you know, we can see what working class people were tuning into and what interested them. But actually, um, Ofcom, so Ofcom is the official complaints avenue for, for British um, media. So if you see something on TV that offends you or that you think shouldn't have been broadcast, you can write to Ofcom. And so every year they produce um, a kind of uh, a review of, of the complaints that they've received in the previous year and the, and the research they conducted. So in, in 2018, um, there was a lot in the Ofcom report about class. So they found that people view the BBC as a middle-class institution that doesn't offer them relevant programmes and content. Um, um, someone said they have a perception of the BBC being more for the upper classes um, rather than for the likes of us, so for the, the working class viewer. Um, and they say that actually that, that's um, kind of supported by TV viewing figures. Um, so actually the amount of people who watch uh, BBC One and BBC Two, the kind of two most prominent channels, uh, from working class backgrounds are much lower uh, than, than the viewers from middle class backgrounds. But um, working class adults are more drawn to uh, ITV, which as I mentioned, it is viewed as kind of slightly less prestigious than the BBC and is the channel on which a lot of the main reality TV uh, programmes are broadcast. They talk about this trend of poverty porn. So I don't know if people are familiar with Benefit Street. It was a programme uh, that was set on, on a street in Britain in which uh, a lot of people were benefits claimants and it constructed this very uh, critical image of, of working class Britain. So, um, and there's, there's been lots of similar things, Jeremy Carl plays into that too. So we get this kind of, um, you know, very kind of critical image, uh, this ridiculing of poor people. Um, so in kind of exploiting the working class participant for kind of, views as is done in, in uh, the program in sense time we kind of get this idea of, of the, the producer and the viewers participating in this kind of classist horror um so oh i'm saying that one so on on deadline um we have kind of a, a similar thing um as ghost watch in some ways so it seems to be a live broadcast and then it starts to glitch down drops the continuity announces is going to be run a previous episode a quiet night in so they show it, but uh, this ghost appears, she causes this glitch. Um, and then um, there's a, in the, in the studio, you hear um, the continuity announcer asking if someone's there, and we hear this piercing scream. So all these glitches throughout the rest of the episode, with lots of reruns of injuries incurred on live television, and the supposed haunting of the studios where, where it's being filmed. And at the end, uh, Stephanie Cole uh, is um, kind of the Star. She's she's starring in the episode that they're supposedly trying to make, that instead gets ruined by all of these glitches. She slits her throat after she takes a call from this character uh, called Alan Spar, who in the narrative um, was a, a member of crew uh, for Coronation Street and, and uh, committed suicide in the studio. She slits her throat, Steve Pemberton gets uh, electrocuted and Rhys Shearsmith falls to his death after seeing a ghost. Um, and again, there's an implication of the audience. So just like uh, in Ghostwatch, they take calls from the audience. 
in a deadline, they interact with tweets. So um, Rishi Ismail reads out a tweet from his phone uh, that says, what's going on with Inside Number 9? Is this part of the twist? So again, the audience is kind of implicated in the narrative. And at the very end of the episode, there's a rerun from a bit at the end of A Quiet Night In, where uh, the two protagonists are shot in the head. And it plays it over and over again for an uncomfortably long period of time. So again, we get this sense of the, the horror of kind of replay and of like the ability to, to focus back on those kind of traumatic um, elements of, of television. So instead of kind of, you know, we hear about it in psychotherapy, kind of repeating traumatic events, talking through them can be therapeutic. But here we get the repetition of, kind of trauma in itself. And we also get the kind of gothicization of soap. So there was a Coronation Street plotline a while ago um, in which the, a, a house was set fire to and there were quadruplet babies inside. Um, and not long before, there'd been an arson attack on a real house in Salford where Coronation Street is set that killed four children. So it's kind of cannibalizing these real life horrors for, for uh, soap opera. And so that's kind of taken into this Coronation Street plotline. And Helen Starr's suicide is kind of portrayed as kind of fodder for kind of entering entertainment they show episodes from this uh, uh, episode of um, a most haunted where they investigate this haunting uh, of the character that they then kind of make into Alan Starr and so there's this idea of kind of working class life as expendable um, which is very much kind of in keeping with the kind of conservative government um, so around that time uh, 19, uh, 17 to 60,000 people had died while waiting for disability benefits so it really does tie back uh, to kind of the actual real threat of the of the world to this extent. So last of all, I'll just whiz through this one. I realise that I've taken quite a long time. The Dead Room um, is set in a, a radio broadcasting studio. Uh, the main character, Aubrey Dudd, you can just see him there in the background. He records horror radio plays that are produced by this woman called Tara. Uh, he starts to experience this kind of unexplained phenomena and he realises it's connected with this man called Paul, who is his former colleague and his lover, uh, during the 1970s, he's worked in radio for a long time, uh, who drowned in a lake. And we eventually find out that actually he let him drown because Paul was threatening to out him. Uh, and he was very concerned of the effect that would have on his career uh, in the 1970s. And so they, they went to a lake and Paul was swimming and he started drowning and Paul just let him drown um, so that, that he wouldn't be outed. But at the end of the episode, he's confronted by Paul's ghost. Um, but um, What's interesting about Paul's ghost is the nature of it. So here I'm going to make my case why I'm including this in this discussion. Um, so uh, Helen Wheatley talks about how the BBC had a basic policy of ultimate good taste in its kind of formative days. Um, so it privileged kind of restraint over excessive display. So um, probably a lot of you are familiar with Anne Radcliffe from Sam's talks or, or just in general. And um, you might know about her distinction between terror and horror and how she thought terror was the, the more impactful kind of affect and the BBC was kind of very much in keeping with this and this kind of links into this kind of nostalgia for the for the radio so the BBC started as a radio broadcaster and was very successful and and is still going as a radio broadcaster as well and um so you know there was this association with the kind of um the suggestive kind of um Kind of more audio based ghosts um, and so a lot of people didn't really like the idea of putting ghost stories on television because it would be too explicit um, and you know they thought that that would kind of ruin ruin the impact um, actually really says that alongside these kind of influences there was also a mode of gothic drama um, which he says referenced the equally respectable gothic line which precisely depends on the clear visual portrayal of every stage action so you know, alongside this kind of radiophonic suggestive history, there's also this quite explicit um, horror based history that influenced um, Gothic television. Um, so at the end of the episode, when we see Paul, he doesn't look like a, a ghost. He looks like a corpse. Um, and so he's got kind of rotten skin, as someone would have if they'd been in a lake for 40 years. His eyes are gone um, and he turns towards Aubrey and it's this horrifying moment and in the final moments he kind of launches himself towards Aubrey but the point of view is aligned with Aubrey's field of vision so it's a handheld point of view camera and so he's launching really towards us so we get this transition here from a suggestive kind of radiophonic horror this very kind of um, explicit and 
um, like visually horrific, kind of more televisual horror, where kind of just like these televisual gothic texts, he comes through the screen uh, to the viewer. And again, it's this idea of network spectacularity. Before he was just haunting Aubrey, and now he's haunting us too. And um, so he kind of um, forces us to confront, you know, our role in this world that Aubrey lives in that prompted him to let him die, you know, this capitalist homophobic world. And so there are lots of references uh, to M.R. James in the story. Um, Aubrey really likes M.R. James. He references him directly. He talks about his model of the ghost story as being, you know, the best one. And he's quite squeamish about sex. And I know there was a talk recently on the kind of um, asexual um, ghost in, in James's stories. And um, Aubrey's kind of like that. He seems very sexless. He won't talk about sex. He's very squeamish about it. Um, but what we have here is that a, a very different side of James. So even though James is kind of seen as this gentlemanly figure, his ghosts are very physical. Um, and uh, they have this real kind of um, physical presence to them. And it, uh, Mark Gates himself made a documentary called M.R. James Ghost Writer. And in it, he talks about how James was kind of anti-sex, but at the same time, he, he includes these hairy clutching arms, slimy tentacle embraces. So there's quite kind of sexual imagery in his ghost stories. Um, and Johnson also says that there was a, before we had this idea of the insubstantial ghost, uh, there was a, the kind of earliest conception of the ghost was more like the zombie, it was a, a, a revenant, a corpse. Um, and so he describes it as being um, uh, a kind of entity that punishes transgression, slimy and definitely corporate, corporeal. So, we get this um, sense of that with Paul because he, he's this very physical ghost, but instead of punishing transgression, he's kind of public punishing conformity, you know, he's punishing Aubrey for being willing to, to let him die instead of have people know that he was gay because he was more concerned uh, about, his, um, about his own career. Um, so again, we've got this like very medieval kind of form of the ghost. Um, and so George Haggerty, who's written a lot on the queer gothic, says that uh, they often have very kind of heteronormative conclusions, um, but in, in the dead room, um, instead we kind of get a, a reversal of that and a, a criticism of that kind of heteronormativity. The horror is, you know, what Aubrey allows to happen. Um, cool. um, and that's kind of really associated with England. So there's a bit where um, Aubrey says, no sex, please. Uh, and, and there's a the famous drama, no sex, please, were English. So there's this very kind of, um, there's this kind of squeamishness, like Ian Forster and Maurice says, England has always been disinclined to accept human nature. So there's this, it's this very English horror of this kind of squeamishness towards sexuality that led um, to these horrors. So um, David Punter has uh, talked about the ghost story being a vehicle for nostalgia and kind of the glance of the shoulder. But Johnson says that actually, they are horror stories and it's a glance of terror, not a glance of desire. Um, and so he talks about how, so um, the Dead Room was kind of part of the revival of the old ghost story for Christmas tradition, which we can talk a bit about after this. And he says that this kind of offers a kind of alternative to kind of feel good um, period drama with what he calls feel bad heritage drama that kind of exposes the darkness of Britain's past and kind of confronts that kind of nostalgia. Uh, which was quite, quite timely. So the, the third most watched BBC drama the year that the Dead Room was broadcast was called The Midwife, which is kind of image of the nostalgia drama. So it completely turns on its head and says that actually Britain has not been a very good place historically and still really isn't. And so we get a very kind of critical image here, facilitated through, I think, television gothic trope, even though it's about radio. So um, I will pause there. I've got a couple of things for discussion, but do you, I'll pause if anyone has some questions about that specifically, and then I'll open up the discussion a bit more broadly. All of these texts, um, even though I talk about the British television Gothic, because um, they're broadcast to the whole of Britain, are English specifically. So there's this idea, you might have heard of, of uh, the myth of Gothic ancestry, which is this idea that um, was kind of disseminated in the 18th century when we had our first prime minister, who was uh, Sir Robert Walpole, who was Horace Walpole's dad, um, Horace Walpole being the first Gothic writer. Um, so for the first time, we didn't have absolute monarchy. And so to justify that to, to monarchists, um, they kind of made up this myth that after the sack of Rome, the Goths, uh, the tribe, 
came over to Britain to protect us from invasion and kind of establish democracy and that we're descended from them. So actually that's kind of inherently English value. That's actually just not true, uh, but people didn't have Google then. So I guess they couldn't really fight. Um, but there was this kind of myth around that. And so um, they kind of, yeah, had this idea of um, kind of English um, kind of democracy as kind of superior value. Um, and they kind of use that to kind of pose themselves as superior, not just to other countries, but also to other parts of Britain. Um, so, so Scotland and Wales as well. Um, so actually kind of the fact that, um, so yeah, so they uh, suggested that, that they were inferior in their love of liberty and institutions to create in Europe. This idea of English inferiority through this myth. And Johnson talks about how broadcasting was used to kind of support um, the aims of the empire and the Englishness at the heart of it. So the BBC was broadcast throughout, throughout the British Empire. And so we actually see this kind of, again, this Gothic connection here in the fact that these texts are very much English texts in this kind of association between the BBC that claims to speak for all of Britain, but really speaks for England and for the southeast of England, very specifically, uh, being humanist in the southwest. But for the most part, these are very kind of, kind of home counties um, texts. So the questions that I have for people are what the television Gothic might look like in other countries. So I have three examples here. The Poltergeist, which is a, an American text, Ringu, which is a Japanese text, and Grave Encounters, which is a Canadian text, which all kind of involve the television uh, in terms of horror. Like I mentioned, they're all actually films rather than television uh, themselves, and they all explore um, the, the television as a source of horror in different ways. And, I was talking to Leo before this and she sent me a clip uh, from a film called Rings, which is the third installment, I think, in the American adaptation of, of Ringu. And um, there's something interesting there about the kind of future of the, of the television gothic. It's this absurd scene in which uh, the ghost comes through the like monitor in the pilot's cockpit. And we were talking about how that evokes kind of these, these fears of terrorism. And um, she was saying that the ghost is actually, she's portrayed by an American actress, um, but she still has this very kind of, um, Japanese appearance of um, his, uh, you know, the long black hair over the face, the long white dress. So it plays into these kind of racist um, fears of the other in a more kind of direct sense as kind of a threat. But yeah, I'm interested to see what people think about what the television gothic looks like or might look like in places that aren't England. So if anyone has any thoughts, um, I would be interested to hear those. And then we have kind of one more slide if we have time that I will lead into from that. Which is from, um, this image is from Dead Set, which is by Charlie Brooker who wrote Black Mirror. And it's about a zombie apocalypse, um, but it's centered around the Big Brother house. And I was very excited by this last year um, because I don't know if anyone remembers that there was a story in the news about how the German Big Brother house didn't know about coronavirus and they were going to do this they were going to broadcast like telling them about it and I remember texting my friend Joe who, who likes dead sets and I was like oh my god it's dead set it's <laughs> because the the Big Brother house don't know about the zombie apocalypse at, at the beginning of dead set so I wonder if there'll be something more around reality television in this experience especially now we've had the back of, of and the country, but also this idea of like contagion narratives because we've got that implicitly in like the viral contagion of the ghost of the television but the actual contagion of, of the zombie I think is an interesting thing and, and ties in really well with Wreck it, it's I mean it's different tonally but the subject matter is quite similar to Wreck the Spanish um, section so yes yeah, so I will end my portion I know that I'm at the end. Um, so if anyone has any last thoughts on that, where we think it'll go now, Leah was saying to me before that, you know, films like Ringu have to really be watched on the television in your living room to have the full effect. And, you know, Deadline was clever in that it had to be watched live to have its full impact, which is very different to how television is normally consumed now. But, you know, we, we don't normally watch TV, or I don't anyway, on TV anymore. We watch it on our laptops, on our phones. And so it's with us all the time, which is, quite a gothic thing in itself, you know, carrying this portable world around with us. Um, so maybe that's kind of a hint to, to where the television of gothic is going to develop into. But I'll pause my contribution there and see if anyone else has any thoughts.